Hi, everybody. I've got this amazing story today of, of a Victorian man who's sent to a batterer's program, actually after he was physically attacked by his own wife. And he ends up being thrown out of that program because he challenges the ideological claptrap that they're being taught. He's Russian. Igor Rogov, and he knows exactly what it's like to live in a totalitarian society. His own grandfather was sent to the Gulag on a fabricated charge of being a Trotskyist and a Japanese spy, and he was tortured by the KGB. Hello, Igor. Very nice to finally get to see you. Finally face to face. Yeah, yeah after, after corresponding with you for a long time. Okay, Igor, we, I want to go back to the beginning where that started. You were living in Victoria, um, you, know, you work as a software engineer, married with one child, and everything went wrong when your wife was suffering depression and became physically violent towards you. Can you tell me about that? Yes, it was postnatal depression. She was uh, diagnosed and it was compounded by her loss of job. She was unfairly dismissed from her position as a nurse. And at the same time, we just moved the houses, so we were all exhausted. Yeah. And um, with strained nerves, it's it's fully understandable. Well, I can understand it from where I'm at right now. Uh, that um, she broke down at what one, one night. Uh, she went home very late. Uh, the kid was thirsty, and when I started reprimanding her, in, in uh, fairly harsh terms that she's not being responsible, she lashed out. Yeah. Uh, she started calling me names, um, very nasty. She never does it before and probably would never do it again, but it was really, really bad. And when I tried to reason with her, uh, uh, we went to a separate room so a kid wouldn't he hear us arguing. Uh, she finally uh, tried to storm out, and when I, I uh, stood in the doorway, she started scratching and biting and what's not. Yeah, and she actually physically in she injured you quite badly. Yes, I was I, I was beaten in a bicep so that I nearly required a, a surgery. Yeah, I, and, mm -hmm. and, and um, so you just didn't know how to deal with this, and in the end you called the police. Yes, I did. Uh, I called, first of all, I called the support line, uh, psychological, whatever I could find. I couldn't get anywhere with it. And I, fi I finally called triple zero and I reported an incident. Yes. Yes, uh, frankly, uh, we didn't have any support here, no relatives, no nobody to help us around. Yeah, yeah. And, and, of, course, that, and of course, that turned out to be a huge mistake because the police um, ended up ended up taking you to the police station. Yes, we waited for about two hours for police to turn up. Uh, finally, they turned up. They interviewed her in a bedroom and me in the living room. And uh, finally, they declared that they're taking me out. Yeah. And uh, asked me politely to bundle in the police van uh, as, as I were in the pajamas. <laughs> oh, so God. I went yeah. They, they so, switched me twice when I, when I was bundled in and when I was bundled out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're taken to the police station. Um, they they notice your wounds and they simply tell you to go to a doctor. Um, yeah, they, they photographed me and then uh, they, they, after that they told me to go to the doctor. Yeah. Um, and you end up in hospital overnight and you're really worried, of course, about the fact that your child is with your wife who was very unstable at the time. Um, yes, of course. Yeah. Go on. Uh, so I, I, uh, I started telling the nurses that I'm in a very difficult position. I have to be protecting my kid. So the nurses contacted the child protection services. Okay. And well, end up, yeah, end up the next day you're in court and you're given a choice to either take, you know, take action against your wife as an adversary and take a legal fight against her or uh, and if you of course if you did that you wouldn't end up seeing your wife or your children for a long time or to go submit to an event intervention order and go into a behavior change program that uh, and so that's what you ended up deciding to do that's right uh, I took the easy way out yeah which of course 
it's not not much of an option there, is it? Um, no, not at all. I, I then I started comparing it to being asked whether I want to be hanged or go <laughs> straight to the guest chamber. <laughs> so you're in this behavior change program. And I just want to say a little bit about that. I mean, the famous men's behavior change program, the program is for batterers. Uh, the Duluth program, the Duluth model is the best right. known. Um, and it's all about men using violence. The idea is that men use violence within relationships to exercise power and control over women. And it's all about That's unequal right. gender relations. There's all this ideological stuff. And the idea is re-education, teaching men about their entitlement. Um, and just briefly, I mean, we know that Duluth doesn't work. There was a big review in 2011, which found that these sort of batterers intervention program, there's no solid evidence empirical evidence for them at, at all. But of course, that doesn't matter. You, you're enrolled in this program in, this is in March 2016. It's called yes. Men's, M, Men Exploring Nonviolent Solutions uh, <laughs> Program. Um, and the idea was to teach you about your anger, but that's not what the program's all about. Tell me what they were all about. Well, uh, it was a mishmash, to be frank. Uh, they tried to dilute the original Duluth with some uh, behavioral psychology yeah. and a bit of meditation on the top of it, which only made it inconsistent and uh, mostly useless. But uh, they, they uh, declared that they, in Australia they do it better than the original yeah. uh, <laughs> so they, 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 don't, they say they don't do Duluth in Australia. They've got a yes. different model. But it's, as you say, it's just a sort of hodgepodge of bit of psychology, bit of media, whatever, meditation, just, all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. They concentrated on safety, uh, safe behavior, safe thoughts, safe uh, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, they drummed it uh, on us uh, as if we are. We're, uh, source of danger in the world yeah you know angry white men we're all middle-aged white men we were selected exactly from the same uh, roughly same age group and uh, same same appearance more or less you had actually initial assessment meeting um and where for instance you you know you tried to tell them what had happened they weren't remotely interested in that um, Not at all. no not at all. Uh, facts didn't interest them. They wanted me to confess the list of 50 sins. And they all listed it at a grade of uh, how hard I perpetrated that sin. Like, I denied my wife money. No, I didn't. Um, so I would, would rate myself as, uh, say, one on a grade of one to ten. <laughs> and so forth yeah. and so on. Um, most of uh, these questions were uh, either too personal or too absurd in my circumstance, mostly absurd. Yep. It's like being uh, invited to a confession session at, uh, you know, that's famous Soviet trials, where they uh, invite you to confess you they're Trotskyists. Yeah, uh, that's right. right. I, I, mentioned that, I mentioned your grandfather had went through that whole well, process. Yeah. So you know a lot about that. And so there's this long questionnaire where you have to confess your sins. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, and the, and they were very disappointed in you that you couldn't come up with anything that they could reprimand you for. Is that right? No, no. But I, I said that I am extremely curious about the teaching, and I, I want to to be there to to see what's all about. Yeah. And it was was satisfactory enough. So yep. at and, the end, uh, we shook we shook hands, and they said, you know, but the patriarchy is re real. <laughs> so yep. that that was interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you're in, and then so they told you it was a great privilege to be allowed in the program because they don't have enough places. Um, mm -hmm. And anyway, so there you're there. And, and as you said, the emphasis is all on safety. Can you give me some examples of, you know, people are talking about what happened during the week, um, and the idea was to interpret everything in terms of whether it's unsafe in terms of behaviour towards women. Obviously, can you give me some well, examples? Yeah. Of an example would be uh, the, the man has a conflict with his boss at work and comes back home in, in a bit elevated emotional state. Uh, so he has to control his emotions to be safe around women and children. Uh, yeah. Meaning that uh, as soon as he sees his wife 
and kid has to lower down his timbre of voice and be very calm, not to make any exaggerated movements like you are in, in a cage with wild animals, imagine that. You don't make any exaggerated movements, you don't make any loud noises, and then you're okay, you're safe. Is that what they <laughs> said? They talk about that, being in a cage with wild, wild animals. No, 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 it's, 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 my, it's my own imagination. Now. <laughs> 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 a wrong okay. example as usual, totally a wrong example. You're, you're very <laughs> badly behaved, Igor. <laughs> I mean, as they found, I mean, very early, uh, in the piece, they realised you were not going to be easy to handle because you started arguing with them, bringing in material about what you, I mean, I know you did a lot of research before you went into the program about Duluth, about the whole issue of domestic violence, what the research actually said. And so you started asking some very pointed questions, which they didn't like. Indeed. And one of the major handlers, as they call themselves, was uh, a devotee of French philosophers. Yeah. Sartre and Camus, uh, which I, uh, of course, was familiar with. Uh, yeah. Back in Soviet Union era, we were all familiar with these French thinkers, as they yeah. are. Uh, trainers of Paul Port uh, and the like. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I, uh, I unfortunately was familiar with that, and uh, I believe I disappointed the handler greatly. That's hilarious, I call them. <laughs> They call themselves handlers, do they? Yes, handlers. Uh, so the um, with wild animals. Yeah. Yes, they are. <laughs> we, we, uh, <laughs> that's so that's funny. very funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. One one of the things very noticeable about these people, they try to stand above you on the, some unreachable moral height from where they can be sanctimonious as they wish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so. Um, you, for instance, I, you gave me an example. There was a, a man in your group who you felt was very vulnerable, who in, he in, in real trouble, and, and he, you, to, he, you felt he could be suicidal, and they weren't remotely interested in you trying to help him deal with that. Can you tell me yes, how that most, most Most uh, frightening case was uh, men in really serious abusive relationship with ongoing and escalating problem. He was already on, uh, heavy, heavily medicated. Uh, he was on some uh, psychotropic drugs uh, that uh, made him a bit slow to react. Yeah. And um, his wife uh, really made the living hell out of, out yeah. of the house. He was trying to escape, but uh, basically was returned and put into this program instead. Yeah. He was seriously contemplating suicide. And, and when you tried to discuss that in the group, how, how did your handlers react? Very angrily. Uh, I suggested a couple of practical cases which were really off, off the chart. I suggested he install cameras around the house uh, to see the reality and show it to the, to the handlers. And yeah. that was the most damning thing to do in their eyes because they think that the reality is designed by men to control women. Yeah. What yeah. you can relate to is emotions and nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and you also brought in some material which you gave to other members of the group yes. about the truth about domestic violence, what the research actually said, and they were very angry about that too. Indeed, I brought uh, some printouts by uh, Sydney-based activist Jasmine Newman, yeah. and I highlighted her name and handled to one of uh, the participants. Yeah. And unfortunately, this piece of paper ended up in the eyes uh, of uh, um, handlers and finally passed to the uh, back to the magistrate as a proof that I am doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um well, Jasmine, Jasmine Newman is a wonderful woman who's for years ran a website for dealing with male victims of violence and, um, and she's not working in that area at the moment. Um, yeah, well, I think she'd be very intrigued to discover that. Um, but essentially what happened is you were thrown out of the group. Tell, yeah, tell me how that developed, yeah? It developed uh, in two stages. First, uh, after a remark about the camera, I was called out um, and talked to in a very angry fashion yeah. uh, by that uh, uh, devotee of 
Sartre and Camus um, who said that it's just not acceptable. You're trying to help, but you're doing everything backwards yeah. from his perspective. Um, so I was uh, told to not to do that again. And I, when I inquired, what should I do instead? Uh, they were not specific. Basically, I was supposed to catch their vibe and follow their narrative without yeah. know, knowing what exactly the narrative is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and second time I was caught with that piece of paper as a yeah. proof that I'm doing something wrong, um, which I denied. I said it was outside the group. It, indeed, the group was over uh, and I handled that piece of paper in the corridor. I didn't I break any rules. Yeah. So I said, I, well, I'm well within my rights as a citizen to try to help another fellow citizen yeah. in a dire circumstance, which they said, no, no, we are responsible for everything that happens inside and outside and around. And I yeah. said, well, luck with that. Yeah. Thank you for telling me <laughs> what's all about. And I'm, I was out of there. Yeah, no, so they, they tried to get rid of you and you ended yes. up back in court in front of magistrates who... Um, yes. Um, and uh, they had sent an, a letter, a nasty letter, full of mm. uh, misinterpretations about what had actually happened. Indeed. Yeah. Instead of uh, saying that I, uh, what I said, namely that uh, my wife suffered from postnatal uh, depression, they said that I called my wife crazy, which I never did, and I never would never do that. No. And uh, they said that I uh, didn't comply with their requests, which is again not true. I complied with every request. Yeah. I just didn't follow their narrative. Yeah. I, I wonder, and at one stage during this process, when you were in and out of the court, you had an anonymous phone, phone call, a threatening phone call from oh, some yes. sort of supervisor. Most yeah? bizarre, most bizarre occurrence was that um, they called me on my mobile phone uh, in a private number, which wouldn't display, of course, and um, uh, man voice, which I wouldn't recognize, told me that. I should stop. Stop yeah. what? Mm -hmm. uh, they said that they discovered lots of printed material in the building. Okay, which printed material we are talking about? They were not specific. Very, very interesting. Uh, uh, I uh, repeatedly asked what exactly materials we are talking about, and I didn't get any answer. But at the end, uh, that voice threatened me with the police, and I mm -hmm. wished him good luck, and that was the end of conversation. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's a Kafkaesque. It's very re reminiscent of some of your, your unfortunate, you know, family background, isn't it? Yes, and it made me realize that I'm exactly what I'm dealing with, with that yep. shapeless, nameless bureaucracy machine where everyone is just interested in their own uh, careers, yeah, and jobs and salaries and nothing else. Yeah. But the magistrate actually then reinstates you to the program. <laughs> yes, then... magistrate, magistrate was annoyed that no one, no one from the program turned personally in the court. Instead, they, uh, they simply ignored it. And uh, she reinstated me with the program. So I called the program again, the same number. Um, explained them the situation that I want to be back. I just had two more sessions. Uh, to completion, but uh, I was told that no, I was not welcome back, no yeah. matter what. Yeah. At the end, yeah. I wrote an, uh, uh, an angry, not really angry, I would say it was acid tongued letter, yeah. uh, just stating the obvious that uh, they are acting above the law and above human decency. Yeah. Hmm. But you, yeah, so you, you haven't heard. So you've been saying, "I want to finish the program." They've refused to respond to your attempts to contact them, and it's in this limbo ever since tw 2016, where you're Indeed. been told by the magistrate to go back, but they won't have you. <laughs> I think it's like a <laughs> yes. the story. Uh, after a completion of program, you're supposed to enter a socially engineered feminist paradise. No, I was denied the entry, but I couldn't go back to my uh, patriarchy. I denied the entry there either. So where do I end? In a limbo. In, in limbo. In limbo. But the good thing, the good thing is, very early in the piece, after you were ending up in hospital that night, you were actually close to your wife again, and she regretted 
what had happened. Yes. And she tried to stop all this by talking to the police and trying to stop. Indeed, all the indeed. My, my wife went several times to the magistrate and asked them to drop the case as a case of severe misunderstanding, which yeah. I believe now it was. There was yeah. no malice on her behalf. It was just strained nerve system. Yeah. So uh, I totally accept that it was error of judgment on her part and on my part greatly. Uh, we both uh, overreacted uh, yeah. and uh, that was it. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. we cried on each other's shoulder. <laughs> oh, well, that's very good. I'm very glad it's had that. All of this has had a, a positive outcome in terms of your marriage. But I mean, this is really, I mean, although I, it's sort of ludicrous and quite funny in a way, it's also a very scary thing happening here where we have these programs which have no validity, uh, no evidence to support them, costing a fortune. I, I got you, Igor, at one point to look at the. I think it's worse. I think it's yeah. just worse. It's, 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 uh, I believe that these programs might drive desperate men to suicide yeah. because they, they end in this absurdity with no reason to cling on at all. Yeah. And claiming, claiming to help them and when it doesn't help them, they're blamed for not behaving in the right way, you know. Indeed. Uh, uh, and, and when I brought the issue of male suicide uh, with one of the uh, seniors of the program, Glenda, she told me face to face, it's just man's choice to commit suicide. Yeah. It's their choice. Yeah. And as you said, a very what convenient, one less problem I'll to have to worry about from their point of view. Yeah, it's scary stuff. And what I was saying is I got you one stage to look at the, we had a Royal Commission in Victoria looking at domestic violence. And there was, tra you know, there were various days of um, expert witnesses be appearing before the commission to look at these, the evidence regarding these, these perpetrator, these batterers programs. Um, and we had, you know, some of our good experts pointing out that there's, they're, what they there's no decent evidence supporting what they're doing, um, that they're claiming to have done some research that shows good results, but that research doesn't show up. Um, yeah, so you examined that all for me, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, and I, I found that the, the way the uh, functioners of this program uh, deflect the criticism really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, uh, most of the uh, scarce evidence would be dismissed and uh, all the uh, criticism to this program would be blamed on lack of funding. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if they had more time and more in-depth uh, brainwashing of men, they would succeed. Yeah. That belief is really, really scary to Very me. And it, it, uh, it really reeks of uh, Maoist re-education camps that would last for years. As you say, this, um, these people presenting the programs to the Royal Commission simply argued for more money and that's what they got. They had the Victorian government responded with another 77 million over the next four years for these sort of programs. Um, and they, but also they did suggest that there should be a proper val evaluation. And what do they do? They put one of our big feminist domestic violence uh, organisations, ANRO, in charge of doing that evaluation. And we know what they're going to find. I mean, this is the the chicken in charge of the hen. The, I mean, the, sorry, the fox in charge of the chicken <laughs> hen. Um, and no doubt they'll find that they we need even more money to make this work and longer and longer programs. It's this is one of the scary. this yeah. is one of the black holes that I saw in Soviet Union late years popping up all the time. It's one of these uh, dead born bureaucratic mechanisms that might consume endless resources. Yeah, uh, it's non-stop, and it would produce mountains of paper and negative social impact. But negative social impact would be ignored. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know. I totally agree with you. I mean, I found your whole story absolutely fascinating. I've recently read um, Gulag Archipelago, and I'm uh, so ashamed of myself that I didn't read it years ago. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, and every time I listen to stories like you, yours, I, it 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 
reeks of that sort of totalitarianism and yes, secrecy indeed. and yeah and the power yeah. of the state imposing ideological rubbish uh on on our society no one daring to sol to speak up against it we live in scary times Igor. but i'm very happy you've come today and, and shared your story i hope you don't have any consequences from doing this video with me. But it's very brave of you to speak out and I'm delighted to have had a chance to talk to you. Thank you. Well, I'm happy, I'm happy to reinstate the truth to a certain degree. <laughs> okay, thanks Igor. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks everybody for supporting me on my YouTube channel. I've got growing numbers of subscribers, which is really exciting. If you'd like to support me financially, go to my donate page on my website. Thanks a lot.